Our next speaker is Dr. Kate Devlin. Um, as I say, an expert on AI and new technologies in relation to culture and society. Do you have slides? Are you all set with slides? Um, are we going to hear about sex robots? No, no sex robots today. But if you want to know about sex robots, go and find Kate's book on sale at every good bookseller near you uh, at the moment. And it's called, what is it called? Turned on. It's a fantastic title, Turned On. So that's just a little side side note. But Kate is going to talk to us today about attention, particularly in relation to AI. Hello. Thank you, Marion. OK, yeah, I'm really sorry that I'm not talking about sex robots. Um, I am, however, talking about AI, which is kind of a component of that. OK. <clears throat> so. Whether you know it or not, you've probably used AI today in multiple ways already, perhaps even just to get here by putting in the, the destination into, into Google Maps or similar software, uh, and it routes you here. Um, you may have used Google or other search engines. Weird how Google dominates this. Um, you may have used a voice assistant of some sort, and um, you may be watching some kind of streaming service that gives you recommendations uh, based on your pre previous viewing habits. All of this is powered by AI. So AI is not just the stuff that's out there um, in the background of things like robotics and large systems. It's in our homes already and, and you know, people are integrating it into their lifestyles. Uh, and whether we like it or not, we can't get away from it. And, and this is uh, one of the more large scale examples, which was uh, Lisa all playing Go against uh, AlphaGo, which is Google's machine that People didn't think that we'd be able to beat, that computers would be able to beat the world leading Go champion for years and years and years, but that actually happened much sooner than expected. So AI has made incredible leaps forward in the past few years, and lots of it came from deep learning, which kicked off around 2011, 2012. And deep learning is a form of machine learning, which is a form of AI, which takes huge amounts of data and uses that data to look for patterns and to predict future occurrences based on those previous patterns and to learn from the way those patterns manifest themselves. I decided that I would get AI to write me some content. Uh, if you are a copywriter, um, your, your job has just got easier, uh, but bear in mind that in the future your job might be under threat. So this is GPT-3, which is OpenAI's lar large language model. And you feed it some content, you tell it, write me something like this, you give it a, a link to a website, for example, but it's also been harvesting data online. And it will be able to generate things for you. So here we, I've said, write a paragraph about artificial intelligence and attention in advertising. And it's, it's come up with something that sounds pretty coherent. So in recent years, artificial intelligence, AI, has become increasingly prevalent in the advertising industry. AI can be used to target ads more effectively and efficiently by taking into account a person's attention span, interests, and even emotions. Additionally, AI can help create more personalized and engaging ads by understanding a person's individual preferences. All true somewhat problematic uh, because yes this is this is really what AI can do um, but I have issues with the way it does some of these things so that's what I'm going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so so yes while AI does have the potential to revolutionize advertising it is still in its early stages there are some limitations the limitations aren't my worry it's the ethical application of this that I get quite concerned about because it has a very dramatic effect on people's lives so thank you, GPT-3, for generating me um, this information. You may have seen headlines in the past few weeks that suggest that uh, a large language model created by Google called Lambda, uh, one of the Google workers thought it might be sentient and was promptly fired by Google. Uh, I can reassure you that there is no sentient AI out there. AI is, is not generalized, it's not conscious, it's not sentient, but it is getting more and more sophisticated. And the thing is, we read a lot into it. So our responses to that AI uh, is very interesting because the minute something shows a hint of lifelike behavior, we tend, to, we tend to project a lot more onto it and we tend to think of it as being more infallible as well. We like to think our technology is neutral. It is not neutral. <laughs> So, yeah, so my, my sort of cry today is pay attention, pay attention to what's going on and pay, pay attention to how AI is using your attention. Uh, 
our ethics are this system of moral principles and the concepts we have of ethics will differ depending on the communities that we are in. They will differ depending on perhaps our backgrounds, what we've been raised to believe. There's no universal standard of ethics, which proves particularly problematic when you try to regulate things like artificial intelligence. So we don't have any high level governance that spans the globe in terms of an ethical set of decision making or anything like that. Um, there's no UN for AI, not yet at least. In fact, countries are barely um, getting to grips with how this is governed at the moment. So at the moment, big tech firms tend to sort of self-regulate what they do and whether or not that practice is ethical. And that, unfortunately, as we've seen, is a recipe for disaster. So people follow all these different ethical codes and moral beliefs. So when we talk about ethics, whose ethics do we mean? When we talk about what we do with AI, who is the we uh, in that statement? A few years ago, five years ago now, uh, there was a, a paper published um, called uh, Moral Outrage in the Digital Age. And unsurprisingly, um, this paper found that uh, moral outrage is a, is a pretty old behaviour that's now really, really widespread in digital media and in online social networks. And they find that moral outrage does far more to, to spread far, far more quickly than happy content. Uh, so, is it any wonder that when we see these viral um, tweets going around or viral social media posts, they tend to be around things like shame, they tend to be um, controversial, they tend to be targeted, they're very rarely spreading happy news, although occasionally you might get a really cute picture of a dog doing something cool. And I'm pro-dog doing things cool, that's always nice. These are just a few headlines from the past couple of weeks um, that I want to use to illustrate a point. The point is kind of about algorithmic advertising and ad algorithmic shaming as well. So tied to this moral outrage, um, people are being fed more and more content that is tailored specific to them. So that's the power of AI. It allows you to target people not just into groups as you traditionally would do, but it allows you to target the individuals by looking at their individual patterns. We couldn't do that without big data. We couldn't do that without that AI. Now there's a really good article that was um, published just this week, I think, in um, New York Magazine, and it's called The Algorithm Knows Me, So Why Does It Keep Shaming Me? Uh, it's by Noreen Malone, and the two paragraphs I really like. The first one is, the unsettling thing is that the algorithm knows me, has studied me clinically at my cheapest and at my most desiring, at my most grasping and my most idealistic. And her, her complaint is that she's being served very, very targeted adverts and very, very targeted content, but she doesn't like it because it's exposing things about her that she doesn't really want to know. Always be aware that when you're, when you're dealing with computers and humans, humans love it when the computer tells them that they're doing a good job. They hate being told off by a computer. And anyone who is a regular Geolingo user will know this because that bloody green aisle <laughs> haunts my dreams. So she goes on to say, the algorithm can't be fibbed to. The algorithm is my mother and my undermining friend and my id and my boss and my guide and my enemy who reads my diary. The algorithm looks me in the eyes and sees what makes me me. Now, of course, there's multiple algorithms out there. She's just, this is generic algorithm she refers to. But it's problematic. The more we target individuals uh, and the more personalized we are, we're still not sophisticated enough to be giving people exactly what they want. They don't want to hear that they're looking up particular types of content. I once, I once did a bit of a snark read online about um, Kate Middleton's shoes. I then got served up weeks of Kate Middleton fashion choices. I really, really wasn't that interested. Um, so, but I now I feel ashamed for having, you know, Googled royal family stuff. So. It's like when you buy a, a lawnmower on Amazon and then for weeks later you're being sold more and more lawnmowers. I need one lawnmower. I don't even have a garden. But you know, this is the problem. It's not sophisticated enough yet, but it's dealing with huge amounts of data. And we do have an ethical responsibility to think about that huge amount of power we have. From the other headlines here, uh, this first one, Netflix algorithm just nearly outed a gay teenager. So this is a story of a 15-year-old. Um, he was watching Netflix with his dad. Now, Netflix, one of the things they do using AI is to target your viewing and, and give you targeted viewing choices for the future. And he had been watching uh, 
something. And what it doesn't just it doesn't just recommend programs, it takes clips from those programs related to the things you've been watching. So in this case, pictures of uh, two men kissing came up on the screen while I was watching with his dad. And this content was kind of, his dad was going, what? why has this come up? Um, and he put, reported on Reddit that it was a really uncomfortable experience. That's just sort of one person's story on Reddit, but there are examples of people who have joined Facebook groups and then the privacy, privacy settings haven't been closed down enough so that their friends and family might see them being outed because they've, they've joined perhaps an LGB, LGBTQ group. Um, there's other ones where uh, there's a story from America where Target um, notified one of their shoppers that they were pregnant um, because of the things they'd be buying. And of course, other people could see this data in their family. So problematic um, use of data as well. Uh, this, anyone can buy ads programmatically. That presents risks in a post-Roe world. So in a couple of weeks ago, uh, when Roe versus Wade was overturned in the US, there was a big worry amongst people that menstrual tracking applications, apps that would track people's periods, could be used against them in uh, post-Roe climate uh, to see whether or not people had been having abortions. Every single app company that uh, the media was contacting would say, oh, no, no, we'll keep it really private, we'll keep that data private. None of them were prepared to say they'd stand up against a subpoena from the court. So this is really difficult. What happens if the people who are buying ads and tracking users based on their data, what happens if those are bad actors? What happens if, say, it's anti-abortionist campaigners who are, are, are trying to use that information to target um, women who are seeking abortions? So this is really sensitive information that's being gathered and anyone uh, could have access to it. Now, in the case of... Um, so ad tech... Uh, went to, to Adweek, Adweek, sorry, went to check out what was um, what companies were saying about that. And Google said they have specific policies that designate who can buy ads on their platform and restrictions on what uh, data buyers have access to. Index Exchange said it sold reviews, uh, sorry, it reviews any demand partner before onboarding it. Microsoft declined to comment. So we don't know who is going to be buying that advertising uh, information. Uh, this bottom one, Chinese researchers claim they have AI capable of reading minds. When you see a headline like that, you can be fairly sure that it's biased. We know that AI brings in our biases and amplifies them. So what they're actually doing here is they were able to use AI to analyze with a lot of doubt how people rea re were reacting based on their facial expressions. This is basically we're getting down to the level of phrenology here. It's really not scientific at all. So I just really like this quote, which is, we're building this infrastructure of surveillance authoritarianism merely to get people to click on ads. So ask yourself, is it worth doing that? Is, <laughs> everyone takes pictures. <laughs> but is it worth doing that? You know, we, ha do, we want to do these sort of things ethically. We want to think about the impact that we have on the world. Uh, how are we going to use this technology responsibly going forward? Uh, so this is fine. Is this fine? I don't know if this is fine. I don't think it is. Uh, and my call to all of you is to think very carefully uh, when you're using technology that involves AI to get people's attention, to capture people's attention, think about how that's being done. Uh, think about who could get hold of that data. It's not enough to say, if you've got nothing to fear, you've got nothing to hide. It's not enough to say, they've said they'll keep my data safe, because it doesn't really work like that. Things change, things move quickly, and we don't know who will end up with that data further down the line. So thank you very much. <laughs>